everybody, and welcome to the Brett Norman YouTube channel. Today, again, uh, doing a second interview with Daryl Eberhardt. And we are going to be talking about some articles that Daryl Eberhardt has written. Wow, was this uh, 14 years, 15 years ago he updated this, I believe, on this Thursday, January 2nd, 2020. Welcome, Daryl. Glad to be on with you again, and uh, we're trying to get truth out again, and we're not trying to be mean to anyone, as we said on our last YouTube uh, session recording, which I call YouTubers, and um, it bears repeating that uh, we're not anti-Catholic, we're not anti-individual Catholic, uh, we're anti-Antichrist, and of course, and that's another subject that we won't get into much to, I don't think, here. But uh, the fact of the matter is, is that almost all, well, all of the reformers were unanimous on one particular subject, and that was who the office of the Antichrist was. And they all pinpointed it to the papacy. So again, we're just uh, giving uh, what the Bible says about things, and the Bible very clearly uh, paints uh, the papacy as the Antichrist, um, but we're we're not being being mean to individual Roman Catholics because I gave my uh, credentials of not being an anti-Catholic in the uh, last YouTube session, and just repeat briefly that uh, most my dad was Roman Catholic, uh, ninety better than ninety percent of my uncles and aunts and fir favorite first cousins are all Roman Catholic. Uh, just about every single one of them, almost all of my friends are Roman Catholic because I grew up in a town that was 75, minimum 75% Roman Catholic, and then 90% Roman Catholic if you went up the road two to five miles either direction, uh, you ran into, this is a very heavy, predominantly Roman Catholic area. So I've got lots of Roman Catholic relatives, lots of Roman Catholic friends. Uh, I was... And lots of first cousins and uncles and aunts, although a good many of my uncles and aunts or, some, or a fair amount of them have died off now, but uh, uh, the vast majority were Roman Catholic, and if not all of them for the uncles and aunts. And um, again, uh, almost all of my friends growing up in high school and that uh, were Roman Catholic. So I don't hate individual Roman Catholics. I want to make that clear at the outset, um, but uh, we don't, we're not in love with the system. The system is a sacerdotal system that uh, basically loves money. And, uh, and when our earlier YouTube session, we talked about uh, Martin Luther and his, uh, by the way, a Roman Catholic, uh, Augustinian uh, monk, friar and monk. And then he be, two years later, he became a Roman Catholic priest who tried to reform the church from within uh, very courageously, and we talked about that. And uh, many people have tried to reform uh, the Roman Catholic Church from the inside. And most, almost all, all your reformers uh, were not Protestants. Your reformers were uh, Roman Catholics, and they very, very courageously, and and some of them uh, ended up, uh, I think, gave their lives, but uh, all of them risked their lives to try to tell the truth of what the Bible says and what Roman Catholicism's practices and doctrines say. So it's just a simple matter of comparison. You compare the doctrines, you compare the practices of the church against what the Bible says. And we've got to have a standard or a rule, and we've talked about this on other YouTube sessions, the rule or the standard has to be the true Bible. And for English, that's the uh, old King James uh, version, KJV, uh, in uh, the English language. And in the Spanish langu language, it's the RVG uh, 2010. Uh, and I think that's, uh, let me see, RV, Reina Valera Gomez, going by memory here. But that is the Spanish Bible that is true to the same Greek texts that are used for the translating the New Testament of the King James Bible. So those, uh, the two best Bibles in the English and Spanish languages are the Old King James Version 
and the RVG 2010 Bible. And uh, so if you're, we always say, we try to remember to say this, the two most important things are Bible, reading, study, and prayer. And so that's what we try to emphasize. And again, make sure we we have to make sure that we've got the best Bible that's out there, the only true Bible in certain languages. And we just mentioned which those two are. So again, um, we're not anti-Roman Catholic individual, and we're not uh, uh, haters and, and anything. So anyone who tries to say this is hate speech, we're just talking about history and doctrines. And uh, history's, true history is important, and true uh, doctrine and true um, practices of any church have to be measured again against the standard, and the standard has to be a true Bible. And that's why we, we emphasize those things. So we just wanted to get that out at the beginning, that uh, neither of us uh, hates individual Roman Catholics. As a matter of fact, I love many individual Roman Catholics. And, uh, and we just want to try to tell the truth uh, to people about history, about the Bible, about, especially about church history and that, because those are important things. Truth, the, the Bible talks about a time when, like, truth is fallen in the street, and people uh, aren't really truth seekers. They just, they like to hear lies, uh, pleasant things that will uh, tickle their ears, but not challenge them. And the whole idea of the Holy Bible is to challenge us to to live correctly and rightly for God, seeking his kingdom first and seeking his righteousness, as we're told to do in, I believe it's uh, Matthew 6.33, I think. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. So the the topic that we're going to cover today, and we found it on one of my, on the archives.org. I hate to say the thing because we put it out and probably the people that are the book burners of like World War II and Nazi Germany burning books that have through for centuries burned Bibles uh, will probably try to get up and mess with, and I hate to even say it, but they they probably going to have gotten the idea and we'll get it to develop. They're going to erase a lot of stuff. They're already in the process of doing that. But anyway, for right now, it is available. And it's one of my old, as Brett mentioned, it's one of my very old issues. Originally, it's an Examining the Tough Issues Facing Christians Today article that I did back in issue number 26 in December 14, 2006. And I updated it through July 26, 2007. And uh, we're going to be looking at it. It's called Celibacy, Sexual Abuse, and the Catholic Church. And the subtitle was Celibate Priests and Nuns. Are they in the best interests of any church that calls itself Christian? And that's what we're going to cover. Ooh, Daryl, I just have to interrupt because Mm -hmm. I have a 10-volume set. It is an Oxford Dictionary set. That was produced, I believe, in 1937, if I'm not mistaken. And they spent a large amount of money to produce this. It's called a historical reference uh, dictionary. I may have got that wrong. But uh, anyway, you can look it up. You can find of 10-volume sets. They are available. They're around $100. I bought a set several years back. And I looked up the word sacerdotal, and very interestingly, in the last definition on the article in this 10-volume set, it mentions the year 1871. Now, what happened in 1869 of December that year? We had the first Vatican Council. So a lot of terms, a lot of very sensitive Things happened in the First Vatican Council, including, uh, well, let's not go into it because we don't have time. But basically, this definition states this, sacerdotal. Uh, It starts out with uh, the uh, late Middle English, uh, holy, sacred, um, sacrifices, has to do with sacrifices. 
And we already know that Jesus Christ is our sacrifice, the all-sufficient sacrifice. He fulfilled the 70th week of Daniel, which we call futurism, is, is this doctrine that the church used and uses still to confuse all Protestants and other believers that the 70th week in, of Daniel is yet future. So it, it just creates a huge amount of confusion to have these doctrines floating around. And as Daryl and I both mentioned earlier in the, the first session we did today, we were talking about many definitions. When you look them up in the dictionary, you find that most of these terms have a double meaning. Well, why is there a double meaning? Well, to break it down and make it real simple, they've mixed the holy with the profane. And when you have a Catholic definition, it can be 180 degrees opposed to a Protestant definition. So you get both, and you don't get the discernment to tell one from the other. You have to learn that on your own. I mean, it's a vicious world, and this yep, and world Brett, just thrives on these definitions, Daryl. And Brett's 100% right, because uh, they're counterfeiters, is what uh, one uh, writer said, that uh, Satan's greatest counterfeit was uh, the Roman Catholic Church, because uh, they look and smell a lot on the surface like Christianity. They use the same terms, Brett, but they mean different things, as Brett already pointed out. Like, justification for a Roman Catholic means different than justification uh, for a Protestant, a real Protestant. The same thing with sanctification, etc. Um, they take a lot of the same terms, but they apply them in a different meaning. Their, their definition of salvation and all of that is it's totally, totally different than what true biblical Christianity is. And so that's why we're doing these sessions, is we just want to point out, as Dr. we mentioned be, uh, on the previous YouTube session today, that Dr. Lorraine Bettner's book is so critical uh, because it's very, very laid back. It's, uh, it's probably uh, Dr. Lorraine, he's a man, Dr. Lorraine Bettner, uh, did a book in uh, 1962, I believe, and it yes. was called, called simply Roman Catholicism. And he just very calmly, peacefully, very nicely, he just uh, says, okay, here's what the Bible says about this, and here's what the Roman Catholic Catechism, or here's what you know the Roman Catholic doctrine and practice is. Oh, and he yes, Daryl. This is a suppressed book, and, and you have experiences with that, Daryl, that you shared with us before on the previous uh, broadcast that we did today, and how those experiences have manifested into, you know, this suppression. I mean, we're still living in a, an age of suppression. Now it's digital suppression. And we talked about how on Wikipedia they have this anti-Catholic slant on everything. Yep. You're no longer uh, able to uh, tell people precisely what this Protestant definition is because it is termed anti-Catholic now. Yep, and that, and that is called the old ad hominem, to use a Latin term. Ad hominem means to the man. Instead of discussing uh, something logically, reasonably, like a, a topic such as purgatory or uh, our regular confession to a priest or priestly celibacy, uh, instead of discussing it reasonably and, and uh, with kindness towards the other party and trying to listen and explain each side, uh, no, they rather than discuss the subject or the uh, topic, uh, they go on the attack. They attack the individual. They try to make him look like a buffoon, he or she. They try to, uh, again, uh, use the name calling. Instead of talking reasonably about the, the subject, like uh, when uh, uh, 
uh, Dr. Eck had his little uh, uh, confrontation, uh, scholarly confrontation with a debate with Martin Luther, it just started to, they started in the ad hominem attacks and, ooh, that's heresy. How dare you, you say that you don't have to be subject to a pope for salvation? That's heresy, heresy. And uh, I loved uh, Luther's right. response. Right, Where he goes, uh, a heresy, you say? Well, you know what? It's still true. And so that's what it is. We want, we want to get at the truth. Luther was trying to get at the truth. And Dr. Lorraine Bettner just laid things out nice and peacefully and calmly. Um, and so what happened is uh, uh, the book, when it came up for republication, uh, the people that were publishing it refused to, to republish it. And then whenever uh, a, a group that I know about personally, uh, the Conversion Center, uh, they wanted to they said, well, if you're not going to republish it, let us republish it. And they says, nope. Nope, we're not going to let anybody republish it. So they got pressure on. Someone didn't like what Dr. Lorraine, again, he's a man, Dr. Lorraine Bettner had written. And as, yeah. as uh, I had told Brett before, uh, my best friend who was a Eucharistic minister and thought, taught the, I think they call it CCD, but it was the catechism classes and that uh, within the Catholic Church, he and his wife were both Eucharistic uh, ministers, uh, they both came out of the Roman Catholic Church, uh, based largely on Dr. Lorraine Bettner's book, uh, because Bettner just very clearly and kindly and nicely lays out, here's what the Catholic Church teaches, here's what the Bible says. And then he basically then leaves it up to the reader, okay, you decide, what do you think's right? And of course, the Bible's what's right, and, and Bettner will eventually let you know that in the book. But he gives you the option of take a look at this, take a look at that. What do you think? And of course, the Bible very clearly lays out that a lot of uh, Roman Catholic practices and doctrines, such as auricular confession to a priest in the ear of a priest, uh, not only is it unscriptural, uh, it's taken out of the old... Uh, uh, Eastern religions, like almost straight out of Babylon and Egypt, this uh, having a goddess and having uh, the auricular confession to the the goddess's priests. But uh, that's a whole different topic. But we're going to talk about uh, celibacy, sexual abuse in the Catholic Church, because it's an important issue. And here in my part of Pennsylvania, we've had a whole bunch of uh, priests come up on charges uh, of uh, sexual abuse, but not a single one of them, to the best of my knowledge, has gone to jail. They, they hang on and keep, uh, the, uh, their lawyers keep dragging it out until the statute of limitations runs out. So the best of my knowledge, none of these priests go to jail. And that's because uh, in my area, they control the judges, they control the sheriffs, they control the uh, police chiefs, and they've openly admitted. I, I remember one of the uh, Monsignors that was a, uh, the right-hand man of the, one of the former bishops in the Johnstown Altoona Diocese. Uh, he openly said, well, well, I don't think we're that worried about any of our guys going to jail because we appoint the police chiefs and we appoint the sheriffs and get the sheriffs elected. And they're almost all Knights of Columbus and the judges and uh, the uh, sheriffs and deputies and, uh, uh, in other words, almost all of law enforcement, etc. Uh, they belong to us. And the guy was very, 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 uh, you know, he wasn't trying to hide it. He just was right out in your face, like, we control everything. So it doesn't really matter what happens in the newspapers, and it doesn't really matter uh, if these people get brought up on charges, because we'll drag it out in the courts until the statute of limitations runs out or we'll buy off. They, they talked about the brown bag with money where they were paying so many people off. And that was very famous or infamous also in Boston with uh, uh, the Boston newspaper that covered a lot of the sexual abuse up there. But again, most of the priests, what we say, walk. They don't go to jail. And so, yeah, they, they uh, skate, as some people say. They just, they don't, nothing happens to them. 
And so that's what happens when you're in an area where the church basically controls law enforcement and the judicial system. And it's sad to say, but uh, again, here, uh, the subtitle of this article was Celibate Priests and Nuns. Are they in the best interests of any church that calls itself Christian? And that's in quotes. So um, here we'll go ahead and get started with that. And uh, I dedicated this issue of my old, uh, one of my old newsletters was called Examining the Tough Issues Facing Christians Today. This uh, issue was dedicated first and foremost to the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Uh, in other words, he's the Bible. In case we haven't figured that out in John chapter 1, it says very clearly, he's the Word of God. So the living Word of God is the same as the written Word of God, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ, and that's the Bible. And uh, the secondary uh, dedication was to those who have fought and who are currently fighting against false doctrine, doctrine, corruption, and tyranny, including ecclesiastical tyranny. And I have here, see Ephesians 5.11, which says, Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them if my memory is working okay. And then I Absolutely give a bunch of, right, Gerald. Nailed it. And, and the uh, definitions, hopefully uh, in alphabetical order here, we'll just go over these definitions. And I use a lot of dictionaries, different dictionaries, but mostly where I can. I use the uh, old 1828 uh, Webster's uh, Dictionary of the American Language. But we just want to talk about these things because they all tie together. The the definitions, uh, again, uh, hopefully I got them listed in alphabetical order, auricular confession. And uh, one of the meanings of the word auricular, of course, according to Webster's 1828, is told in the ear. And of course, again, this came straight out of uh, Babylon, as far as we know, the, the priesthood that existed under Semiramis, some people say Semiramis, uh, they had auricular confession uh, to a priest there, and that's how they controlled people. Hmm, smells kind of like what they've done through the centuries through taking people's confession. Next definition is Babylon, and that's according to Webster's New World College Dictionary, 4th edition, 2006, says it's an ancient city uh, on the lower Euphrates River in what is now uh, central Iraq, the capital of Babylonia, noted for wealth, luxury, and wickedness. Boy, does that apply to some other cities that we know, does it? Oh, Daryl, it applies to all large cities that we know. Yes, it, it sure does. I think of Minneapolis, St. Paul as Babylon, too, because, boy, I'll tell you, luxury and wickedness, it reigns supreme in the United States of America today, doesn't it? It sure does, and we're under God's judgment because we're doing the same thing that the uh, different empires that God uh, spoke uh, in the past, and including uh, his own people, and we, we've talked about that a number of times, but we'll just mention very quickly that uh, God's people in the northern kingdom uh, played, and we're using the Bible's terms, uh, played the harlot on God. And uh, the Nor this is when the two kingdoms separated from each other, I think during the time of Rehoboam, which was one of Solomon's sons. It used to be a, a, a unified kingdom under King Saul and King David uh, and uh, King Solomon. But under Solomon's son Rehoboam, it split into two kingdoms. And you had the northern kingdom in the northern part, the northern tribes. And you had the southern kingdom in the southern part, and that was uh, basically the two tribes, Judah and Benjamin. And the northern kingdom, as God says, played the harlot on him. They turned their back on God's statutes, and God sent prophet after prophet after prophet to him, saying, hey, straighten up, guys, straighten up, guys. And they basically snubbed their nose at God. And God says, okay, I've had it. You're in trouble. You're toast. Uh, I'm giving you the modern paraphrase version. He basically said, you're toast. I'm, I've, I've sent my prophets. I've tried to warn you guys uh, to quit playing the harlot on me, to turn, quit to, uh, that you're doing mixing Baal worship with uh, the worship of Jehovah. Uh, so you're, you're mixing paganism in with, with a, a supposedly lip service that you're giving to me, and I've had it. And I'm bringing the Babylonian Empire, I'm sorry, the Assyrian Empire, to punish you, the northern kingdom, and they're going to clean your clock, basically. 
And that's what happened. The Syrians came in. They basically moved. They killed a lot of people, but they they moved almost everybody that was an inhabitant there out, and they brought in uh, foreign foreign peoples to repopulate the area, and they were called Samaritans. And that's where the, the hatred of the southern kingdom, like the Judeans, were the Jews against uh, the Samaritans because they weren't of the same people. They're not weren't of the same race, basically, or same ethnic groups and that. And they were different people, and they were. That's why the the Samaritans were so hated by the people in Jerusalem and that. And then, okay, so then you had the southern kingdom. These were God's people uh, in Judah, uh, which was the primary tribe, and Jerusalem was the capital. And they played the harlot on God, and God says, "Hey, did you guys pay attention? I stomped." Your sister, he calls the northern kingdom the sister. He says, I, I stomped your sister, and I used uh, um, the Assyrian Empire. It was a rod in my hand to punish them. Guess what? I'm bringing in Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonian Empire, and they're going to stomp you guys. And they're saying, whoa, wait a second. We're God's people. It ain't never going to happen. That's what they were telling the prophets that were telling them, get ready for judgment. And they said, no, we have the temple here. and we're God's people, and no, but nothing bad's ever going to happen to us. And our prophets are all telling us peace and security, and that we watch out when people start when your prophets start telling you peace and security, and everything's fine, and judgment isn't going to come. And judgment is already on uh, the, uh, the United States, and it's very clear that it is because we have played uh, the harlot on God. But anyway, God brought in the Babylonian Empire, and the Babylonians killed a lot of people in Jerusalem, and they besieged the city, and they took it. And uh, they took a fair amount of the people and transported them out. Some of them went uh, into Babylonia and uh, into the parts of the Persian Empire. And some of them, uh, some a few came back, a small percentage, but the vast majority of them were taken out of the country and never came back. So they, the sword, the pestilence, and the famine and came in, and even the wild beasts a little bit, and God used uh, the Babylonian Empire to punish his people. So it's just something to, to pay attention to. But anyway, Babylonia was that ancient empire in southwestern Asia, uh, in the lower valley of the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, are two famous rivers, and it flourished uh, approximately 2100 uh, B.C. to 689 I, to 689 BC, and again as Chaldea or New Babylonia, and then that was the the New Babylonia was probably about approximately 625 to 538 BC. And uh, uh, Alexander Hislop, in a very good book that he has, the Two Babylons, uh, he he reveals some remarkable similarities between pagan Babylonian priesthood. <laughs> Remember, folks, we were talking about that, and the priesthood of the Roman Catholic Church. For example, auricular confession to an authorized priest. So as they say in the Bible, Ecclesiastes, nothing new under the sun. Uh, they just keep giving us reruns and reruns and reruns of the same old movie without changing the plot or anything. Uh, next definition is celibacy, and that's... a my, from my favorite dictionary, my 1828 American Dictionary of the English Language. And celibacy is an unmarried state, a single life. It is most frequently, if not always, applied to males or to a voluntary single life. And my comment is, is Lorraine Bettner in his book, Roman Catholicism, 1962, page 298, tells us by celibacy is meant the sectarian requirement of the Roman Catholic Church that its priests, monks, and nuns abstain from marriage is not to be confused with the vow of chastity, which is also taken by the members of these groups, and which means abstention from sexual relations. According to canon law, so there's a difference there. According to canon law, the vow of celibacy is broken if the priest marries, but not if he engages in sexual relationships. You see how the relations, you see how they get around some of these things. Bettner then adds this interesting comment. The requirement for celibacy is entirely without scriptural warrant. In other words, it's not there. And was not generally enforced in the Roman Catholic Church 
until more than 1,000 years after the time of Christ. So this thing of celibacy in in, uh, the history of the world is a fairly new thing. It wasn't the Catholic Church didn't start mandatory celibacy and start enforcing that until about a thousand years after the time of Christ. So it's just something they just decided to do because they didn't like the priests leaving any of their money and holdings and stuff that the church could eventually wanted to get their hands on. They didn't want them leaving them to their uh, legitimate children. So, you know, they couldn't leave them to their bastard children, for a lack of a better term. Next definition, celibate, per Webster's 1828 Dictionary, and I won't give you all the full title each time. It's a noun, a single life, celibacy, chiefly used when speaking of the single life of the popish, meaning the Roman Catholic clergy. Uh, chaste, per C-H-A-S-T-E, uh, according to Webster's New World College Dictionary, 4th edition, 2006, it's an adjective, the first two meanings, not indulging in unlawful sexual activity, virtuous, number two, sexually abstinent, celibate. Okay, chastity, per Webster's New World College Dictionary, 4th edition, 2006, the quality or state of being chaste, T-E, spelt with a T-E specifically, A, virtuousness, B, sexual abstinence, celibacy, C, decency or modesty, D, simplicity of style. So my comment to the preceding definition is from Lorraine Bettner and his book, Roman Catholicism, again, page 298. He says, by celibacy is meant the sectarian requirement of the Roman Catholic Church that its priests, monks, and nuns abstain from marriage. It is not to be confused, again, with the vow of chastity, which is also taken by members of these groups, which means abstention from sexual relations. According to canon law, the vow of celibacy is broken if the priest marries, but not if he engages in sexual relations. So you see how they get around having uh, a live-in girlfriend or boyfriend uh, sometimes, and that doesn't that vow of celibacy isn't broken then. It's not, if he's engaging in sexual relations, that's okay. But he's not allowed to get married. That's the key thing to remember is they didn't want their clergy to be married, whether it was a priest or whether it was a nun. Cloister, next definition, again, Webster's 1828. Literally, and that's a noun, literally a close, an enclosed place, or a close or enclosed, enclosed place, a monastery or nunnery, i.e. a convent, a house inhabited by monks or nuns. Cloister, per Webster's 1828 Dictionary again, uh, verb as a verb transitive to confine, confine to a cloister or monastery, to shut up to shut up somebody up inside a building or inside walls, to confine closely within walls, to immure, which means to enclose within walls, to shut up in retirement from the world. Cloistered, per Webster's 1828, shut up in a cloister, inhabiting a monastery, solitary, retired from the world. You can see the these things all kind of tie together with you wall people up in a place where they can't get out. And sometimes, especially for nuns, that meant a life sentence. And uh, only a few escaped from the from a century ago when, when they were in cloisters. Okay, close per Webster's 1828. Noun, a, an enclosed, enclosed place, any place surrounded by a fence or other body, like a high wall I put in here, which defends or confines it. The key word is confines it. Uh, confession, per the Roman Catholic Baltimore Catechism, confession is the telling of our sins to an authorized priest for the purpose of obtaining forgiveness. And that's why the priest in the confessional goes, uh, I absolve you. And when he says, I absolve you, that means that your sins are forgiven. But we're told in the Bible, only God can forgive sins. Uh, another, a man can't do that. So that's something to think about. 
Confession, meaning number three in Webster's 1828. The act of disclosing sins or faults to a priest, the dis- disburdening of the conscience privately to a confessor, sometimes called auricular confession. Again, auricular meaning into the ear of an authorized priest. Confessional for Webster's 1828, the seat where a priest or confessor sits to hear confessions, a confession chair. And my comment is ex-Roman Catholic priest Charles Chinicky at times refers to the confessional as the confessional box. A more modern term would be the confessional booth. Confessor per Webster's 1828, a priest who hears, one who hears the confessions of others and has the power to grant them absolution. In other words, forgiveness for their sins. Again, only God can forgive sin. Convent, per Webster's 1828, an assembly of persons devoted to religion, a body of monks or nuns. Number two, a house for persons devoted to religion, an abbey, a monastery, a nunnery. Convent. Again, these are we need to know these definitions because they're important. Webster's New World Dictionary, Second College Edition, 1974. De- definition number one, a community of nuns or sometimes monks living under strict religious vows. And let, let me say right here is that you don't put a bunch of men together living a secret life, you know, without having some strange things happen. It's not normal for a whole bunch of men to live together. Uh, Unless you're in the military and you don't have any females around or something. Number two, it's the building or buildings occupied by such a group of monks and nuns, etc. Fornication, per Webster's 1828, the incontinence, in other words, lacking self-restraint as regards sexual activity, the incontinence or lewdness of unmarried persons, male or female. And the Bible, by the way, speaks against fornication, and that's out of the newer Bibles. They took the word fornication out, and they call it sexual immorality. But fornication, I think we all know what fornication really means, and God forbids it. And fornication is basically sex outside of marriage. It doesn't, it's not always confined. Oh, listen to the definition. Webster's New World Dictionary, Second College Edition, 1974. Definition number one, voluntary sexual intercourse, generally forbidden by law between an unmarried woman and a man, especially an unmarried man. And then they have definition number two. And I like some of these dictionaries that are not after two year 2000. Bible, A, any unlawful sexual intercourse, including adultery. That covers a lot of ground there because fornication is including adultery. And B, worship of idols. Ah, spiritual fornication there. Friar, Webster's 1828 American Dictionary, says, and one, an appellation common to the monks of all orders, those who enter religious orders considering themselves as a fraternity or brotherhood. Friars are generally distinguished into four principal branches, mainly or namely, a, minors, gray friars or Franciscans. B, Augustines, Augustinians, in other words. C, Dominicans or black friars. And D, white friars or Carmelites. Two, in a restricted sense, a monk who, monk who is not a priest, uh, those friars who are in orders being called fathers. And here's friar, according to Webster's New World Dictionary, Second College Edition, 1974, is Roman Catholic Church, a member of any of several mendicant orders, especially an Augustinian, a Carmelite, a Dominican, or a Franciscan. Hierarchy, per Webster's New World Dictionary, Second College Edition, 1974, is a system of church government by priests or other clergy in graded ranks. And the Bible says we're all just brethren. So a system that has a layered system of hierarchy is not really biblical because the bishops are just overseers or elders in the Bible. They weren't bishops wearing Dagon hats. B, the the group of officials, especially the highest officials in 
in such a system of church government and C, a group of persons or things arranged in order of rank, grade, class, etc. Then the uh, Jesuit order, this is my little definition, one of my oldest ones, because I see it's pretty short. My, my other ones grew to about a page. But the Jesuit order is a religious order of the Roman Catholic Church officially approved by Pope Paul III in 1540. It was started in 1534 uh, is the unofficial date there that uh, Ignatius of Loyola did. The primary goals of this order are, one, to roll back the Protestant Reformation and the freedoms that it brought to many of the inhabitants of this planet, two, to enhance the power and prestige of the papacy, and three, to rule despotically over the governments of this world through the papacy. The head of the Jesuit order is the Jesuit Superior General, also called the, known as the Black Pope, and he's the real power behind the papal throne. You know, he always wears black and the white pope wears white, although we have a Jesuit pope now who wears white. Uh, okay. And uh, the Jesuit order is infamous for fomenting revolutions and wars, assassinating heads of state, and subverting nations. They got tossed out of so many different Roman Catholic countries. Some countries like Portugal and Spain and France, which were all predominantly Roman Catholic. Uh, each of those countries, I believe, tossed the Jesuits out at least three times apiece. Mendicant, per Webster's 1828, an adjective number two meaning practicing beggary. In other words, you're going around begging as a mendicant friar. Mendicant, per Webster's 1828, is a noun, is a beggar, one that makes it his business to beg alms, one of the begging fraternity of the Romish, in other words, the Roman Catholic Church. And that's when we did our session in the morning. The big problem that Martin Luther ran into when he started attacking uh, the indulgences, uh, which were bringing lots of money to these, uh, like the Dominican uh, uh, Johann John Tetzel that was going around, that's what caused Luther to uh, who was, again, uh, a Roman Catholic priest, an Augustinian, uh, caused him to try to reform the church and to complain about the indulgences. Next definition, monastery. And we'll get through these. They're, just hang with us because they're important to, to this uh, topic. Per Webster's 1828, monastery, a house of religious retirement, or of seclusion from ordinary temporal concerns, whether an abbey, a priory, or a nunnery. The word is usually applied to houses of monks, mendicants, friars, and nuns. Monastic, per Webster's New World Dictionary, Second College Edition, 1974, first definition of or characteristic of monasteries. Number two, of a characteristic of monks or nuns or their way of life, ascetic. Austere, monk, per Webster's 1828, a man who retires from the ordinary temporal concerns of the world, sounds good, doesn't it, and devotes himself to religion. Unfortunately, most of these guys were running around trying to collect money. Monks usually live in monasteries or entering, uh, upon entering, which are, they take a vow to observe certain rules. Some, however, live as hermits in solitude and others have a strolling i.e. a wandering life without any fixed residence. Mother Superior, per Webster's New World Dictionary, Second College Edition, 1974, is the woman head of a convent. And uh, there's been a lot of problems with sexual abuse of nuns by other nuns, including their superiors. Uh, none, per Webster's 1828, a woman devoted to a religious life who lives in a cloister or nunnery secluded from the world under a vow of perpetual chastity. Of course, you have some of your more modern nuns here in the United States that uh, dress a much more modern way, And uh, but it depends on the order, And because I have uh, my, my best friend's one of his sisters is a nun. Nunnery, per Webster's 1828, a house in which a nun resides, a cloister in which females under a vow of chastity and devoted to religion reside during life. Papal Rome, this is my definition that I coined. I did it a few times in my life. It's the government, 
of the Roman Catholic Church, Papal Rome, whose headquarters is presently in Rome, Italy. Penance, because there's a difference between penance and true repentance. Uh, Per Webster's New World College Dictionary, 4th edition, 2006, number one definition, Roman Catholic Church, Eastern Orthodox Church, both of them. A, a sacrament involving the confession of sin, in other words, this confession, um, repentance and acceptance of the satisfaction imposed, followed by absolution by a priest. The repentance part, by the way, often got ignored. You just paid so much money or something. B, the satisfaction imposed as the recital of certain prayers. You know, go say 50 Hail Marys and 10 Our Fathers. Uh, Or give $50 to the priest fund. Anyway, number two, they'll tell you, oh, we don't really do that. Number two is any act of reparation, self-punishment, etc., done in repentance for a sin or wrongdoing. And my comment to that is for Roman Catholics, penance involves the requirement that they make auricular confession to an authorized Roman Catholic priest at least once a year. Now, some people say they don't do that, but I believe they're still required to do at least once a year. And uh, they'll tell you that some priests insist on them doing it a lot more frequently than that. Ed comment to that, my ad comment to that preceding definition, meaning number B which is one, one under the direction of a confessor, the penitent, uh, more above most often refers to a Roman Catholic under the direction of a father confessor. In other words, under the direction of a Roman Catholic priest who hears their confession. Vatican, per Webster's New World Dictionary, Second College Edition, 1974, the Papal Palace, consisting of a group of buildings in Vatican City. Number two, the Papal Government or Authority. We need to remember this is very important, and that is is that uh, the Vatican now, uh, which is you know the papacy in in the past, but the Vatican is the more modern term for uh, since especially 1929 and the Lateran Treaty and that. But here's what the uh, again what per Webster's New World Dictionary Second College Edition 1974 says for Vatican the Papal Palace consisting of a group of buildings in Vatican City to the papal government or authority. So again, we have to keep in mind that Roman Catholicism is a religious system, but it's also a state. It's a legitimate, it's got diplomatic relations with uh, a lot of different countries. I forget over 170 or something. It's called the Holy See and uh, S-E-E it's spelled. And uh, it's it's the biggest diplomatic, the most, uh, uh, well, certainly it's got the most experienced diplomatic corps in the world today. And if you go to any group of ambassadors meeting at a, any given country, if say you have the your ambassador your Spani- from Spain, your ambassador from France and that, they're all sitting there. Well, if, uh, of course, the uh, whoever is representing the, the papacy or the Vatican now um, would be the senior diplomat. And he's going to be the chair, the head of uh, all the others meeting there. So the, the Vatican is got, has got the greatest diplomatic service, got the greatest intelligence gathering service in the world. And I have a comment here. Uh, I'm not a Roman Catholic. And again, I'm not uh, anti-Roman Catholic as far as individual Catholics go. So I've already talked about that, but, uh, Again, uh, what we want to talk about sometimes is the things that they've done wrong, the Holy Inquisition, the Holy Crusades, Holy Wars, etc. That's what we're against is this idea of every 30 to 50 to 60 years that you go out and you have a genocide and where you kill. And we mentioned this in the previous one. uh, uh, Credible historians estimate at the minimum 50 to 100 million Again, minimum uh, Christians, real Christians, uh, Bible believing Christians that were slaughtered uh, via uh, the Inquisition and the holy, so called Holy Crusades, and that, that were, were driven into or went into uh, areas, uh, especially they wiped out almost a, a good bit of the population, almost all of it that was Bible believing, 
in uh, southern France and uh, part of it in northwestern Italy. So that's the kind of thing that we're we're trying to warn folks that we're not supposed to uh, keep our mouth shut about some of this. Dave Hunt had an interesting quote. He says, we are told to love one another as Christ has loved us. Pop psychology trivializes that command by equating it with a positive attitude. Forgotten is the first duty of love to tell, to speak or tell the truth. He quotes Ephesians, or gives that as a reference, Ephesians 4.15. Real love does not flatter or soothe when correction is needed, but rather points out the error, which is blinding and harming the loved one. Christ said, as many as I love, I rebuke and chase. And we're going to have a lot of Bible in this one, uh, which is b- blinding and harming the loved one. Christ said, as many as I love, it, I rebuke and chase and be zealous, therefore, and repent. He means genuine, real repentance with godly sorrow. Revelation 3.19. Instead, the idea today is now current that love excludes rebuke, ignores the truth, and seeks unity at any price. Sounds like the ecumenical movement, doesn't it? Only disaster can result. That's from page 403 of his book, The Woman Rides the Beast. And so I'm writing more and more, and I put this in here. I'm not going to get into us why I I was writing more and more about the Roman Catholic Church's hierarchy, and especially the Jesuit order, because every time I kept turning stones over concerning history, the history of genocide, the history of massacres, pogroms, or pogroms, some people pronounce it, uh, slaughters, massacres of Jews, of Bible-believing Christians. Every time I turned to stone over, especially in the last four centuries, guess whose footprints were always there? It's, it's not like I'm being picking, picking on somebody and being nasty. It's just that I get tired of them murdering people and hating Jews. They hated Jews like crazy for way before uh, the Jesuit order came along. So that's why I'm covering a lot of these these topics. And Again, absolute power's long been the pursuit of papal Rome, and history has recorded papal Rome's deep hatred for religious liberty and freedom of conscience. And the U.S. Constitution, its Bill of Rights, guaranteeing such liberties. Uh, uh, Brett and I were talking earlier that Pastor Bill Hughes wrote two good little books called uh, The Secret Terrorist and uh, uh, The Enemy Unmasked, where he very clearly shows, especially in the first book, uh, The Secret Terrorist. Uh, that uh, uh, from the get-go, that papal Rome hated uh, religious, real religious freedom, uh, freedom of conscience, and that, and uh, and uh, they, they they spoke out strongly against uh, all of the freedoms, especially freedom of conscience and uh, uh, real religious liberty, because uh, they always liked to, to have the church married to the state, the state married to the church. I should put it that way. But the syllabus of errors that were 1864 by Pope Pius IX, he condemned all of uh, the liberties that we hold dearest in our hearts. Again, especially freedom of conscience, freedom of religion. Uh, They only want freedom of religion when they're in the minority. Once they get to be in the majority, all of a sudden, uh, religious liberty, uh, real religious liberty, religious freedom uh, dries up for anyone else, and they admit that. And so... That's why we're we're doing this, and uh, so I want to, as a way of introduction, uh, and so there was an Associated Press by Francis de Emilio, reported the following in November of 2006. He had, uh, quoting him, he says, a Vatican summit led by Pope Benedict XVI reaffirmed mandatory celibacy for priests Thursday. In a statement after the three-hour meeting, the Vatican said the value of the choice of priestly celibacy, according to Catholic tradition, has been reaffirmed. So they rubber stamped everything that said that, you know, mandatory celibacy, you got to, you got to be, you got to have mandatory celibacy for priests. You can't have married priests. Well, you know, again, that goes against what the Bible says. And we're going to get into some of the Bible verses that contradict what uh, papal Rome's doing. Over the past several decades, we have seen In the open press and media concerning sexual abuse, a lot about them, of sexual abuse of boys by Roman Catholic priests, as powerful as the Roman Catholic Church is in America, she hasn't yet been totally able to sweep this abomination of priests sexually abusing boys and teenage boys under the rug. 
But is sexual abuse of boys the only type of sexual abuse occurring within the Roman Catholic Church? And the answer is no. The abuse of girls and women, to include nuns within the Roman Catholic Church, may be just as extensive, according actually to a book I've got, and I'll mention it down here in a few seconds. Uh, it's, it was written by a Roman Catholic, by the way, named William H. Kennedy. It's called Lucifer's Lodge, Satanic Ritual Abuse in the Catholic Church. He died a suspicious and early death, William H. Kennedy, because he was spilling the beans. But William H. Kennedy said the abuse of women and nuns and girls within the Catholic Church is probably even much greater than the abuse of boys. Now, that's saying a mouthful right there. Uh, however, the Roman Catholic Church has been much more successful in keeping that type of sexual abuse of women and girls and nuns hidden from the public. And they, they've done a much better job of sweeping that one under the rug. Uh, the Boston Globe reported uh, following on January 8, 2002, this quote is being taken from Lucifer's Lodge, Satanic Ritual Abuse in the Catholic Church by William H. Kennedy. Here's what he says. According to the 1996 survey of nuns in the United States, which was intentionally never published by the Roman Catholic Church, but was leaked by some Vatican insider, it is reported that a minimum of 34,000 Catholic nuns, about 40% at that time, of all American nuns, claim to have been sexually abused. Did you get that? About 40%, according to polls that were taken, of all American nuns, claimed to have been sexually abused. Three out of every four of these nuns claimed that they were sexually victimized by a priest, a nun, or other religious person, meaning a person of a religious order. All nuns who claimed repeated, repeated sexual exploitation reported that they were pressured by religious superiors for sexual favors. So what does that say about throwing a bunch of women living together or a bunch of men living together, and especially men having access to these women? Um, it creates a lot of problems and it creates a lot of danger. Uh, during the past several centuries, a few nuns have escaped from closed or cloistered convents, and they have given their testimonies. And there's a book out, out there. And of course, they're all demonized and uh labeled as uh, either not cases or uh, just anti-Catholic. But concerning the horrifying, if you have a sister or a relative, a daughter uh, that's in a nunnery, especially a closed or cloistered one, I'd want to find out uh, if, you know, what's going on in there. Uh, anyway, uh, they have given their testimonies concerning the horrifying things that go on in some of these closed or cloistered convents. These former nuns who escaped from different convents did not personally know each other. They were often separated by several generations or more or by distances of hundreds or thousands of miles. Yet their testimonies agree just about totally in every detail concerning the horrors that have taken place in these various closed or cloistered convents around the world. So this is a serious problem. And, of course, they're going to deny, uh, they're always going to ad hominem these people. They're going to claim some of them never existed. Uh, but I've heard the testimonies of some of these uh, nuns on that have been uh, put on audio cassette tape. Shows how old I am. And uh, But uh, one of them was Sister Charlotte. She was an ex-Carmelite nun who escaped the convent, who gave her testimony in the 20th century. Uh, Maria Monk, they really try to demonize her, uh, that that Alberto Rivera, who they demonize, again, ad hominem attacks uh, like crazy, uh, that Maria Monk was an ex-nun, and he published uh, her book, uh, Dr. Alberto Rivera, who looked like he had been poisoned, uh, who she had escaped from a convent in Montreal, Canada, and gave her testimony in the 19th century. Carlene Lynn had been a nun for 10 years and had been in a convent with 200 other nuns. She had been a Roman Catholic for 53 and a half years before she came to truly know the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, now again, some, many of these people, they never even crack open a Bible, and the nuns admit that. Uh, these and other ex-nuns risked both verbal and physical attacks, sometimes risked their very lives. Some of them were murdered, by the way. 
to tell the world about the some of the sick perver that doesn't mean it happens everywhere, but it does happen more frequently than it should. But anyway, that they risk their very lives to tell the world about the sick, perverted horrors that have occurred in some of these closed or cloistered convents of the Roman Catholic Church. Their testimonies deserve to be heard. You can go up, by the way, on the Internet and find a, a type in Sister Charlotte or whatever. Her real name was, I forget now, uh, Keck or something. But anyway, uh, just uh, type in Sister Charlotte. And when you listen to her testimony, you, uh, most of us, uh, who've been around real truth for a while, you begin to pick up real quick whether someone's faking something or whether someone's telling the truth. And uh, I get, when I listened to her and I heard her testimony, um, just had the ring of truth to it. Anyway, um, they do, their testimonies deserve to be heard and action should be taken to make sure that these horrors never occur again in any country of the world. We're probably way too late to stop any of this because this has been going on for a long time. And, and we just need to look at my my newspapers in the Altona Johnstown area, which covered uh, the sexual abuse cases. And I mean, the papers were full of the accusations and everything. But again, they control the, the, the judicial system, the law enforcement system and openly laugh and brag that uh, none of their people are going to go to jail. And so far, I don't think any of them have. So anyway, back to the here. Uh, could mandatory celibacy for Roman Catholic priests and nuns uh, have played a significant role in the sexual abuse of boys, girls, and women by priests and other Roman Catholic clerics? Do some of the nuns sexually abuse other nuns? Can we find mandatory celibacy for the priesthood in the Holy Bible? Should a church be calling itself, that is calling itself Christian practice mandatory celibacy? I'll give you the answer. No, they shouldn't be. It's not, it's not normal. And so uh, let's take a look at some of the interesting and relevant and Bible's important Bible verses and quotations that deal with this topic. And we're going to look at the history of mandatory. Then we're going to look at the history of mandatory enforced, in other words, enforced celibacy and the horrible fruit that it has produced or, or that, it has be, that it bears. So here are some relevant Bible verses with some comments. The Apostle Paul now is writing, and, he, and folks, he wrote under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And this is 1 Timothy 4, verses 1 through 3. Now, of anything we talk about history, it's interesting, especially true history is interesting. But when we give Bible verses, and the Bible verses disagree <clears throat> with whatever church, it doesn't have to be the Roman Catholic Church. It could be the Lutheran Church. It could be the Methodist Church. Any place where the Bible is different than what is opposite of what your church teaches, well, then guess what? Your church is wrong because the Bible's right. It's always right, especially the true Bible is always right. Some of the newer versions, hard to say about anything about them um, because they're not very reliable based on the wrong manuscripts. Okay, here's 1 Timothy 4, 1, 3. This is the Apostle Paul writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. It says, now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter days some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Get this, it's calling something a doctrine of devils. Speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry. Okay, well, here's that forbidding people to marry uh, sounds like mandatory celibacy to me. Forbidding people to marry, and it says it's a doctrine of devils. Forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats. Hmm, do we know anybody that does that? Which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. Okay, so very clearly, uh, forbidding to marry the Apostle Paul, no wonder they, they, they bank everything on Peter and don't want to really pay much attention to Paul. Paul's saying right there, if you have a church that's forbidding people to marry and commanding them to abstain from meats, hmm, he calls that a doctrine of devil. So we need to pay attention. Okay, my comments about that verse is... Uh, is there a denomination that 
has both forbidden to marry and asked its adherents during certain periods of history to abstain from eating meat. Well, we know who's done that. And then the Apostle Paul tells us, number two, clearly uh, where such doctrines of forbidding to marry come from. They come from seducing spirits and devils. Uh, the newer versions call them demons, but they're devils. That word it defines itself. It's, it comes from the word evil, devils. Okay, here's another uh, Bible verse. 1 Corinthians 9.5. Again, Apostle Paul. No wonder they don't like Paul that is quite as much. Pa, uh, Paul wrote, again, under the inspiration of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. He says, have we not power? In other words, don't we have any right? Have we not power to lead about a sister, a wife, as well as other apostles, and as the brethren of the Lord and Cephas? Well, that's the Aramaic name, by the way, for the Apostle Peter. So he's saying that Cephas, we're, we're told elsewhere in the Bible that uh, the Lord Jesus Christ healed uh, Peter's mother-in-law. So unless Peter's wife had died, guess what? Peter had a mother-in-law. He must have been married at one time at least. But anyway, Paul wrote, have we not power to lead about a sister, a wife, as well as other apostles? And as the brethren of the Lord and Cephas, 1 Corinthians 9, 5. So very clearly, um, that Aramaic name, Cephas, which means a stone, uh, not the stone. He's not the foundation stone on which the church is founded. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. I think most people, at least uh, most Bible scholars, admitted that at one time, but uh, they seem to have switched around now because the the, the Catholic, Roman Catholic Church insists that that Christ founded uh, uh, his church upon Peter. And no, that's not what the Bible says. The Apostle Paul here is telling us that the Apostle Simon Peter took a wife with him at least on some occasions, as he traveled to various locations. By the way, he was never in Rome. He was in Babylon. It's not a code name for Rome. Uh, uh, the apostle Paul wrote the letter to the Romans. Uh, he greets everybody that's there of any importance, and he doesn't even mention Peter. Now, if Peter was the first, much less the first pope, but if he was the first bishop of Rome, then the apostle Paul committed one of the greatest uh, diplomatic faux pas in the world because he doesn't even name Peter or Cephas or Simon Peter or whatever you want to call the Apostle Peter. He doesn't even name him when he, his letter to the Romans, which was to the Christians that were at Rome. So again, one of the greatest faux pas in Christian history if Peter was really the first bishop of Rome, which he wasn't. Anyway, Here's another Bible verse, and this is 1 Timothy 3, 2, and 4. And the Apostle Paul, again, writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he says a bishop. And that's a word, the same word means an elder. It's not like the guys that wear the, the fish hats. It's, it's an elder. It's an overseer. It's a guy that's kind of like the pastor or whatever. He's an elder, uh, one of the older guys. Uh, and he's going to give the qualifications of a bishop. So he says, or an elder, a bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach. And, uh, verse four, one that ruleth his, well his own house, no, no other words, he means his household or family, having his children in subjection with all gravity. First Timothy 3, 2 and 4. So again, we find the Apostle Paul giving the qualifications for a bishop slash elder, and he says the husband of one wife. So where do we see mandatory celibacy? Just like I asked the priest that was running the catechism class for me. Uh, I never converted to Roman Catholicism. Don't let them tell you I did. I never did. And uh, like I said, the priest threw me out after about uh, three of the first six sessions I went to, I asked questions he couldn't answer. And one of them was, hey, how come the Apostle Paul says that you're, you're to have a, uh, a bishop, elder, uh, or a deacon be the husband of one wife? Hmm. I said, where's mandatory celibacy? He goes, is that in the Bible? So again, 
you know, ignorance of the Bible, and then they just give you their uh, tradition. And tradition with the, the church is at least equal to, actually, many times their tradition trumps what the Bible says. So again, uh, in 1 Timothy 3, 1, 7, we see Paul giving the qualifications for a bishop. Notice these, the, the, one of the qualifications of this bishop or elders, the husband of one wife, uh, and he must be able to control his children. And number three is, does Roman Catholic doctrine, uh, how does the, uh, the Roman Catholic doctrine concerning celibate priests stack up against what the Apostle Paul taught concerning married clergymen? In other words, these bishops and deacons, elders bishops and elders. So uh, that's an important thing. Another Bible verse, that, and this is, this is critical because the Bible is saying something different than what uh, papal Rome teaches. Uh, the Apostle Paul wrote, again, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, likewise must the deacons be grave, and that means sober or serious. Even so must their the deacons' wives be grave. Uh, did you get that? Wives. So you know, these are the two main uh, offices, or well, the uh, two, only two real offices that are in the church. You don't have archbishops, you don't have cardinals, uh, you don't have popes. You don't find that anywhere in the Holy Bible as, a, as an official position within the church. Uh, you've, got, you've got the elders slash bishops, or, and you've got deacons. Those were your two offices. And both of them, the Apostle Paul gives the qualifications that they're to be married uh, to one wife. And ha if they have children, they have their children uh, obe in o obedience to them. Uh, so here, again, we've got, uh, again, uh, where the, the, clearly that they're saying that their wives are to, what their wives are to be sober and serious, et cetera. And again, the deacons, same thing. It would be much closer in power and authority to, Roman Catholic priests and Monsignors than to the Roman Catholic lay deacons of today. So the deacons of Paul's day would have been much, much more powerful than what uh, uh, the deacons that we see today. Uh, as far as, you know, there were administrative, more administrative types, the deacons. And that's what we're shown in the Bible and Acts. Here's another Bible verse, Paul writing, again, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, 1 Corinthians 7, 9. But if they, and he's talking about the unmarried and the widows in verse 8, but if they cannot contain, in other words, live in continence or chastity, and that's per Webster's 1828 dictionary, Paul says if they can't contain, they can't keep their chastity, then let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn. Mm, so Paul's saying if you can't you know, live a celibate life, uh, uh, not a mandatory celibate life, but a voluntarily celibate life. If you can't live voluntarily cel a celibate life, then it's better to marry than to burn. In other words, to burn with lust, to commit adultery and commit fornication. He says it's better to marry. That's the Apostle Paul again, 1 Corinthians 7, 9. So again, you know, we've got, Paul really emphasizes marriage is being very important. And if you read everything that he says about it, he says quite a bit about it. Here's another one. Uh, Timothy, 1 Timothy 5.14, Apostle Paul, right, again, writing, I will, in other words, he, he desires or direct, I will, therefore, that the younger women marry, bear children, guide the house, give not occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully. Again, Apostle Paul writing. So, you know, there's a whole bunch of Bible verses that kind of indicate that oh, I don't see anything about mandatory celibacy. Mandatory means enforced. The church enforces this. Here's some very relevant quotations with some comments by me. It is, um, this is, let me see, the first quote is, oh, it's interesting, Tex Mars used to be fairly good at it's pointing out some of the problems in the papacy, but then he kind of changed over the years. But here's an interesting quote. I transcribed a few of, off of his Power of Prophecy broadcasts. I used to get all, a lot of his audio tapes. This one's called The Priests of Rome and the Ravages of Satan. And he says, now this is Tex Mars. He says, it is not pleasant to report these things, talking about sexual abuse by Catholic priests, 
Why do we do it? Well, someone has to. The Bible tells us uh, to have no part with the works of darkness, but rather to reprove them, expose them. That's what, using Ephesians 5.11. Un- that means to unmask them, expose them. Why do we do it? Expose, in other words, expose sexual abuse by Roman Catholic priests. We do so because we don't want any more little children to be harmed. We know of the ravages of Satan by these, and he's talking about Roman Catholic priests. With And with tears, we warn others, leave these Roman Catholic churches, get out of them. If it is true that 50 to 80 percent of Roman Catholic priests are homosexuals and many pedophiles, leave these places, these dens of iniquity. Get out and don't put your children in harm's way. This is Tex Mars, host of Power of Prophecy broadcast from one of his tapes, CDs, that was entitled The Priest of Rome and the Ravages of Satan. So again, it's not a pleasant topic to talk about, but it's a topic that must be, as I said, tackled. I used to call my one newsletter tackling the tough topics. Uh, the 50 to 80 percent of Roman Catholic priests who are homosexuals is no doubt accurate figure that he came up with. A Monsignor in Omaha, Nebraska, who headed up Boys Town, reported similar figures, especially in Roman Catholic seminaries. And here's a quote, again, by Tex Mars, uh, the same tape, audio tape, The Priest of Rome and the Ravages of Satan. He says, Roman Catholic sources themselves say that over half of priests some authoritative sources say up to 80% of all Catholic priests are homosexual. So that's uh, interesting. Uh, here's another one, and this is, again, Tex Mars, the same. Uh, I used to transcribe a lot of uh, these tapes, and uh, so the quotes that you won't find them in a lot of books and that, uh, I took from uh, audio tapes and CDs. Uh, here's Tex talking about a young man considering entering the Roman Catholic uh uh, priesthood. And uh, let's see, this is, again, from his tape, uh, audio CD, uh, The Priest of Rome and the Ravages of Satan. He says, I counseled him, uh, talking about a young man entering the priesthood, and told the young man and his mother that most of the priests who run the seminaries are homosexuals. But if this young man went there to a Roman Catholic seminary, they would insist that he would have sex with them with some of the priests, or they wouldn't let him become a priest, because now increasingly it has become a requirement for the priesthood. And they actually cashier out and get rid of those who are not homosexuals. These are people who have written me and told me I was kicked out of the Roman Catholic seminary because I would not have sex with the priests who are the instructors. This is happening across America, so more and more we find fewer and fewer Roman Catholic priests who are straight, who are normal. Again, Tex Mars in in that uh, audio, I think I had the cassette, because in those days, uh, that's again showing years going back. And there was a, I have a a comment here, a Monsignor in Omaha who headed up Boys Town reported that the number of homosexuals was particularly high in the Roman Catholic seminaries. Okay, here's uh, another quote, and this is Peter DeRosa. He's a Roman Catholic historian and former Jesuit, author of the book Vicars of Christ, The Dark Side of the Papacy, and here's what he says. And by the way, Peter DeRosa writes, I've got his book. He was a former Jesuit, Roman Catholic historian, by the way. I think he's a Brit, Peter DeRosa, uh, author of the book Vicars of Christ, The Dark Side of the Papacy. I've got several copies of it. I think it's out of print now. But here's what he writes with humor, too. If you read his book, it's very interesting. He put the history of celibacy makes for reading so black. A large part of this history of celibacy is the story of the degradation of women. Evo of Chartre, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. I did have some French, but I was not very, very good there at it, better at Russian and Arabic. Anyway, Ivo of Chartres, who lived from 1040 to 1115, tells of whole convents with inmates who were, to get that, he calls them inmates, who were nuns only in name, but they were really prostitutes. That's Peter DeRosa, Roman Catholic historian, former Jesuit from his book, Vickers of Christ, Dark Side of the Papacy. Here's another good quote. 
same man, Peter DeRosa, Roman Catholic historian, same book, Pickers of Christ, Dark Side of the Papacy. You want to read an interesting book, it's hard to get. You'll have to find a used copy of it. Been out of print for a while, but it was one of the most fascinating books I ever read. Here's what Peter DeRosa says. The proof of harm of the harm done by celibacy comes not from bigoted anti-Catholic sources. Oh, on the contrary, it includes papal and conciliar documents and letters of reforming saints. They all point in one direction. Far from being a candle in a naughty world, priestly celibacy has been more often than not a stain on the name of Christianity. Here's one from Ralph Edward Woodrow, his book, Babylon, Mystery, Religion, Ancient and Modern. They got him to recant later what he wrote, but 1966 on page 111, he says, the doctrine of forbidding priests to marry met with other difficulties over the centuries because of the confessional. It is plain to see what the practice of girls and women confessing their moral weaknesses and desires to unmarried, in other words, celibate priests, could easily result in many abuses. A former priest, Charles Chinicky, one of my heroes, who lived at a time, he was a Roman Catholic priest for many years. He was, I think, 50 years in the Church of Rome. And he wrote a book by that title. But anyway, he wrote a book called The Priest, the Woman, and Confessional. And it's what he says in here. A former priest, Charles Chinicky, who lived at the time of Abraham Lincoln, and by the way, was a good friend of Lincoln's, and was personally acquainted with him, meaning Lincoln, gives a full account of these abuses in his book, The Priest, the Woman, and the Confessional. And that's from Ralph Edward Woodrow, again, the book Babylon, Mystery, Religion, Ancient and Modern, 1966, page 111. And uh, that book is available today. You can get that book, The Priest, the Woman, and Confessional. Very good, especially if you can get the uh, word copy, the full copy of it. Here's another quote from Dave Hunt, A Woman Rides the Beast, 1994, page 162. <coughs> Excuse me. If one is on the level of gods, what privilege, privileges could not one claim? Gods are above the law. No wonder then the popes began to declare openly, openly that they had power over kings and kingdoms and all persons and power to behave like tyrants. They added pretense of infallibility only the, the added pretense of infallibility only made matters worse. Each priest and nun, by association, shares, through a lesser extent, this same corrupting absolutism and elevation above laypersons. Add to this pretended godlike authority the unnatural rule of celibacy, an intolerable burden which only a small minority of persons could possibly bear, and the stage is set for all kind of evil. Boy, has it ever been. Dave Hunt. And a Woman Rides the Beast, 1994, page 162. Here's another good quote. Let me see here who says this. This is also from Dave Hunt, pages 162 and 163 of A Woman Rides the Beast. He says, one may understand that mandatory celibacy is not taught in the Bible, nor was it practiced by the apostles. This teaching developed as an integral part of the evolving papal system and it was an evolving system, by the way, and gradually became essential to it. The concern was not morality, for celibacy proved to be a veritable cornucopia of evil. In fact, the rule of celibacy was not the prohibition of sex, but the prohibition of marriage. All down through history, not only priests and prelates, but popes, as well as uh, as well, had their mistresses and visited prostitutes. Many were homosexuals. No member of the clergy was ever excommunicated for having sex, but thousands have been put out of the priesthood for the scandal of getting married. Why then the strict insistence upon celibacy, even to the present day, if it really doesn't mean abstinence from sex? It is because the rule of celibacy has a very practical and lucrative result for the church. It leaves priests and especially bishops and popes without families to whom to bequeath property and thereby impoverish the church. The clergy must have no heirs. 
Pope Gregory VII, bemoaning the difficulty in stamping out marriage among priests, declared, The church cannot escape from the clutches of the laity unless priests first escape from the clutches of their wives. Here is another virtual, or excuse me, vital reason for celibacy, to create a priesthood without the encumbrance or and loving loyalties of wives and children. Thus, fornication and adultery, although forbidden in theory, are preferable to marry a marriage relationship. That's Dave Hunt, Woman Rides the Beast, pages 162 and 163, his book, 1994. And then here's another interesting quote by Tex Mars, again from that tape CD entitled The Priests of Rome and Ravages of Satan. So Tex Mars started out kind of good, and then he got changed. Anyway, I read from Religion News Services, also in the Jackson Citizen Patriot newspaper, recently this article, and the headline was, Notre Dame University allows gay films and the vagina monologues. The quote, that's what it says. Uh, the article goes on to say, a gay film festival and the play The Vagina monologues will continue to have a place at the University of Notre Dame, the school's president has announced. It was called uh, the Queer Film Festival at Notre Dame. Again, that's Tex Mars, Power of Prophecy broadcast from his taper CD entitled The Priests of Rome and the Ravages of Satan. Okay, Daryl. Daryl, I got to interrupt you now because we've yep. come to a full hour and a half and we are halfway through the document now wow so this might be the best place to stop for this first portion of your reading of your own article that you wrote uh what is that now 14 years almost ago yeah so uh we'll have to I get to back together again for a second uh a second session of this won't we daryl yeah, I got. The, I didn't know there was so much in here about. Well, this is uh, good. Uh, it's very important to touch on these topics. Uh, yeah, we call this uh, dealing with the tough, to tough topics, and this is a topic uh, that has been under suppression for hundreds of years. More than for hundreds. Sure. That is for sure. More than a millennium. Yeah. Yeah, this is sure to get us accused of hate when, again, we are just trying to tell uh, the truth of what is, has been going on for, for quite a while. It's been going on for centuries, uh, this enforced mandatory celibacy, and it's resulted in nothing but heartache and heartache and heartache upon um, uh, individuals, uh, their family members. Uh, a lot of sexual abuse, uh, again, not only of uh, uh, boys and teenage boys, et cetera, but as uh, William H. Kennedy in his book, Lucifer's Lodge, pointed out, the problem is much greater and that the abuse of women, according to William H. Kennedy, a Roman Catholic author and writer in his book, Lucifer's Lodge, he says, uh, we're just hitting the tip of the iceberg, he says, Actually, the abuse of women, as far as he was concerned, and he's talking a lot of it as satanic ritual abuse, and that was the subtitle of his book. Uh, he says the abuse of women is probably even much greater. And so we need to remember that. That's a, a very important thing. And so thank you for having me on to do this, and um, I look forward to us, God willing, being able to do uh, a part two to this because uh, uh, we have a lot of other good quotes in here. Uh, and that's, like you say, this is a good place to stop. So for thank, thank you so much for having me on. And well, Daryl, if you wish to difficult... just keep going, I mean, we could make this as long as you wish, but I think you had expressed that you would really like to keep these down to an hour and a half. Right. And I think that's a good idea because well, number one is it gives us a chance to drink something like a Pepsi or a coffee or a or Coke or something and get a little caffeine in it. Or have a dinner. <laughs> or have a dinner and feed our cat. Yeah. yeah, right. Like over here where I'm at. So Yeah, I don't have cats, folks, but 
but Brett does, and his cats start me yowling when they kind of wonder what they do on all that. Oh, they're time. very, very happy right now. They're both sleeping, and and I oh, fed good. them already. But uh, no, I think I think it's important to uh, to draw it down and and to have a second session. I agree because then we can become or uh, just come fresh to the mic again, and, and exactly. Uh, it's it's really just an incredibly horrible topic that has touched just countless lives that uh, we're not really aware of the implications uh, for people that have actually grown up in Roman Catholic families and have adopted the traditions of the church. And in many cases, unquestionably, uh, maintained them and continued in that doctrine that the Roman Catholic Church has put them forth into, and including yeah. also other Protestant denominations like the Lutherans. There are many Roman Catholic doctrines and, mm-hmm. uh, and uh, uh, teachings that have made their way back into the Protestant churches, including the Lutheran Church that I came out of. And it's shocking to me uh, exactly how that's happened. But, uh, you know, it's warned of in the Bible many times. And the more you read the Bible, the more you become familiar with uh, all of these instances, Daryl, that are warned by Jesus himself and his apostles and uh, other testimonies also from the Old Covenant in the Old Testament. So it's a huge, huge study, a huge problem. There are many people entangled in an emotional disaster in their lives, and they want answers, and they don't get them through the media. They don't get them through ordinary uh, sources. They have to try and look on their own. And they do their own research, and perhaps they stumble into this video on the internet. Yeah, and we covered in uh, a previous YouTuber session uh, with Eric Glissman, um, I have a lot of good books written by Roman Catholics, and one of them is, it looks like it's about 500, 600 pages. It's called The Rite of Sodomy, and it was written by Randy Angle. Randy is a female name, Randy Angle. And uh, she's in Pennsylvania, one of the Pennsylvanians uh, that has written uh, quite a book about uh, uh, sexual abuse and that within the Roman Catholic Church. And all these, almost every single book I have about sexual abuse in the Roman Catholic Church, like I mentioned, William H. Kennedy, Lucifer's Lodge, they were every book, I, every single book that I have on sexual abuse in the Roman Catholic Church was written by a Roman Catholic trying to deal with this terrible issue and uh, courageously doing so. By the way, Richard Bennett has interviewed many former nuns and priests, uh, but many nuns, including some that were uh, taught, tell about some of the abuses that were going on within the system. And if you just uh, do a uh, internet search of Richard Bennett uh, and uh, YouTube videos or that, you can find many videos of uh, him interviewing former priests and former nuns, but the, especially the former nuns were the ones that will sometimes tell you about the abuse that was going on within the system. So again, thanks for having me on. We know it's not a pleasant topic to cover, but God wants truth to be, to get out there as far as uh, the, the systemic sacerdotal system, abuse of uh, women and men and boys, and God just wants the the truth to get out. And so uh, thank God for these many Roman Catholics that authors that I have books of uh, that are exposing this issue. Uh, The problem is, is getting the courts and the law enforcement to do anything, at least in my area of Pennsylvania, and I know many other parts of the country, they have the same problem, Brett. Yes, they do, Daryl. And we've talked about that. And Tom Fress also on Inquisition Update has talked about that with uh, 
this uh, Canadian uh, researcher who has confronted some of this uh, before uh, dealing with the problem of abuse in Canada from the, oh, correct me if I'm wrong here, Daryl, the indigenous Native American children that have been abused by the Roman Catholic Catholic priesthood. Um, I'm trying to remember his name right now. Is that Paul Serap? Nope, nope, nope. Okay. Uh, it's someone else who has been, uh, I, I uh, learned about him years ago when I was doing some research. Uh, and uh, he, uh, he found out that uh, the, uh, the court system has no jurisdiction over the, the, uh, the papacy. So, in a lot of places, the world. Forgive that me is for the case. not remembering his name. I can't remember his name right now. But uh, go ahead, Daryl. Sorry. Yeah, the only thing I would say there is is that happens in many parts of the world where the church operates as its own system within a country, and in many countries, the laws of the country don't apply to the priests. The priests and the nuns and that are. Uh, they're under a separate system uh, that's totally separate. And so the church insists on uh, policing its own, which they do a very poor job of. Uh, but uh, generally, uh, to, if, to let the secular, quote, secular authorities uh, uh, get any of their people for doing crimes that they ought to do time for, uh, the church very, very, very much in most, almost every country of the world, but especially where that is predominantly Roman Catholic, uh, those countries, uh, the law enforcement and judicial systems cannot touch, generally cannot touch a priest. So they can get away with murder, much like some of the diplomatic people get away with running someone over and then pull out their diplomatic passport. And they, uh, they're excused for having a crime in the United States of America. Uh, the church kind of operates that way. I shouldn't say kind of, it does. So again, thanks for having me on with this subject, and we got we covered quite a, a bit of good quotations and uh, quite a, a bit of uh, a history and, and quite a bit of uh, Bible verses that very clearly contradict that sacerdotal system and its mandatory celibacy. So th- God bless you, and thank you for uh, for you tackling a very difficult and, and tough topic. Oh, you're certainly welcome, Daryl, and and I'm doing this for our listeners out there on the internet and also for those people that we've never been introduced to or uh, they've had the uh, um, success of finding our material yet, Daryl, because there is a lot of suppression going on. Mm -hmm. And the only reason I do this is because I know about it and I've dealt with my own tough topics and I have a lot of agreement with uh, the research you've done, the research that others have done to expose the dark deeds of this papal structure, this a church and state collusion. How do you want to say it, Daryl? It's just, it's incredible how they have succeeded in sweeping under the rug uh, a, a huge, huge portions of testimony against them. In order to, to protect themselves, they have to obscure any information that exposes the evil priesthood, what they're doing. But yet, at the same time, they can openly sing to Lucifer in Latin. That should just send shivers down the spines of everybody, as far as I'm concerned, that has anything to do with a ritualistic type of worship. Because it all goes right back to Rome, doesn't it, Daryl? Yep, yep. Uh, we heard them singing Lucifer, Lucifer, which yeah. must be the Latin for Lucifer. And they're just in rebellion against God. And they are just, they're going to be condemned. 
Yes, they will. And like we said about uh, the Northern Kingdom and the Southern Kingdom paying the price, individuals and nations and religious systems, and we're told it very clearly in the Bible that God puts it in the mind of uh, several of the secular people to uh, turn on uh, the harlot of Revelation. And so uh, 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 Judgment Day is coming. Uh, They think they've gotten away with everything, and uh, they kind of laugh about it and think they're uh, untouchable, that uh, nobody can touch them. But Judgment Day is coming, whether for individuals, whether for nations, or for a religious system that uh, steals the glory of God and uh, seeks to jump into his mediatorship role with uh, individual priests uh, getting between an individual and God who can only forgive sins. And that, that's why I'm glad we got to cover some of those Bible verses, because uh, only God can forgive sins, not some celibate uh, or a priest who's hearing a confession in his ear uh, from somebody. That's, that's not biblical. And so thanks uh, for having me on about this. And again, let's hope that uh, people realize we're not trying to be mean to anyone. We're just trying to get the truth out and try to uh, to save people from this system. Yes, um, Daryl. But you know, the truth is something that is almost impossible to be, uh, how do you say, uh, nice about it, because it, it is a, a very very strong warning that our Lord and Savior from the Bible wants us to carry. It is hot. It is not cold. So in order to give someone a message that is hot like this, they need to understand that it is fundamental. And and there's a word that is probably going to go by the wayside very soon. It is fundamental to our faith to reprove and rebuke others that are involved in a system of abuse that cannot find any true light that the gospel is trying to give. Right. And that's where we're, we're reaching into this sector of darkness. And of course, uh, it's going to be very difficult for the message to get through, but we still have to try, Daryl. We have to try. Just like Jeremiah, God told him, hey, I want you to go talk to these people. And he was talking about the southern kingdom of Judah. I want you to, to witness to them. They're not going to listen to you. I'm going to tell you ahead of time. They're not going to pay any attention, but I still want you to go and talk to them. They'll at least know that a prophet's been there and said something. So they're going to be against you, but just know that I want you to, they're not going to listen to you, but I want you to be a witness. So that's something that we need to learn from is God doesn't care whether anyone listens or not. He wants the warning or whatever, the the talk telling them about judgment to get out there, period. What they do with it then is up to them. But the prophet's job, and we're not saying we're prophets, but a lot of times the Bible uses the word prophet as a preacher, it means he's got a, he's preaching a message that God has given him, and God's message often was a message of judgment. More often than not, it was judgment. Yeah, God generally right, doesn't say peace and security; He says judgment coming. Right. So again, thanks for for tackling this tough topic with me. Yep, that's spot on, Daryl. Because he said when they say, meaning the leaders, mm-hmm. say peace and safety, then sudden destruction. Yep. And that's what we're concerned with, right, Daryl? Exactly, because the priests, and when you, we, have, we call them uh, peace, uh, uh, peace, peace and security or prosperity guys, they're out there telling you everything's going to be fine. Look out. Because God doesn't generally send preachers and prophets to, to tell you about uh, sweetness and goodness. Yeah, it's Thank all you. about prophecy, exactly. not prophets. That's with... Uh, P R O F I T S. Yep. It's not about those types of prophets because that's what Simon Magus was all about. We were talking about that earlier this morning. You know, and Paul rebuked him and said, Thy money perish with thee. Yep. 
And that's what we should all be concerned with. This money is only a tool to obtain uh, things that you need. There are people that need food. There are people that need shelter. There are people that need to be taken care of. And in a system that uh, limits things, uh, it, it can be very hard to get what you need. Yeah. So that's why we have beggars, and and it's good that people have mercy, and are allowed to uh, to help each other out. And that's what this is about too. We're just trying to help each other out. So with I, that, we're gonna say good night, and uh, or good afternoon, or good morning, wherever you're at. And uh, we'll catch up with you next time on part two of this little uh, little audio or session we're doing on celibacy. So thank you so much, Daryl. And we'll thank see you. everyone. Yeah, go ahead, Daryl, please. I just said thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. You're welcome. And we'll, we'll catch up with everyone next time. Bye-bye.